Um, good morning and welcome to the session on opportunities for designing sustainably with plastics. Um, my name is Edward Hobson, I'm head of design at KTN. KTN, if you don't know us, we're the Knowledge Transfer Network. We're UK's innovation uh, network, which means really helping companies to take fantastic ideas to, and make them successful in the marketplace. Uh, we help them by really talking across the communities in terms of businesses and industry, funders who are able to provide money into that space and investors, and also universities in terms of looking at the talent that's coming through universities and the research which is done in those spaces in order to really promote the commercialization of great ideas into the marketplace. We've got a fantastic session for you this morning um, with my panel of four experts here. Um, and I'll introduce them in a moment. Uh, but really, we're looking at sort of the opportunity for design to contribute into this space. Uh, there are multiple dimensions and multiple pathways for design to really contribute uh, to optimizing the, the potential for circular economy here, whether it's at a sort of materials level and a products level to get the design of those products right, whether it's at a, a services level in terms of designing new services and new business models to keep materials out of the ground, or whether it's really looking at a whole systems approach and how we design that across the economy. So, so many levels in which we can engage in really shaping and making a difference in terms of this agenda. My panel uh, cuts across uh, various aspects of that and we have Sally Beacon, who's a colleague of mine at KTN. Um, Sally leads our, our plastics program. Uh, Roy Crox, sitting next to Sally, who's a, a specialist in packaging at RAP, the Waste and Resources Action Program. Next to Roy is Matt Davis, who's a senior industrial issues executive at the British Plastics Foundation Federation. And last but not least, Mary back home, uh, who's uh, working at the automotive agency Envisage. So great line of speakers there. Um, I'm going to step aside and invite Sally up to the podium uh, to, to give us uh, her reflections and insights. I'm going to kind of try and keep everybody to about seven minutes. Uh, because we've got, we want to have time for questions and a and good conversation at the end of that. So speakers, if you see me waving my hands, uh, that's the end. <laughs> and we need to move on. So Sally, can I invite you to come up, please? Seven minutes isn't very long. I can talk for an hour or all day or to my daughter's chagrin uh, every single day about plastics. So um, the future... It's plastics. You're all too young to have seen that film, The Graduate, with Dustin Hoffman in. But actually, I'm looking at you guys now and thinking you are the future for the solution for plastics. So, yeah, I hope you're all thinking about it and thinking of ways that you can solve it. So, um, I work for the KTN and I'm currently running a network called the UK Circular Plastics Network. This isn't about making them circular like my... Uh, uh, bangle I've got here, but it's about the circularity. It's about using them uh, all the way through manufacture to uh, end of life and closing that loop. So not a, a value chain, but a value necklace. Um, so if some of you have got some cards. Please do join our network. It is free uh, to join, and there's lots of um, uh, opportunities you can get from joining that. So... Plastics are bad, aren't they? Aren't they awful things? Look at them polluting our environment there. These are called witches' knickers, which I think is absolutely fantastic. So it's a degrading uh, poly bag, uh, bin liner. And I got this on my Twitter feed, Plastic Kills. It's a child from a, a primary school who'd drawn this picture. Now, for me, actually, obviously, it's awful that we're polluting the environment. But for me, it isn't plastic that kills. It's our poor husbandry of the material that's allowed it to kill. So I don't think plastic is a bad thing, necessarily. This child here in an incubator, a baby, plastic saved that child's life. Again, with asthma inhalers, I bring this one up because actually I have patents in asthma inhalers. That's part of my background. I was in the medical industry. They're really, really good materials for what they need to do, and they, are, they help, help save lives, and they're also um, very good at keeping food fresh for a long time and hygienic. So it is actually true that a wrap on a cucumber is a, a better thing to do life cycle analysis-wise for a cucumber than not to use that plastic. And also, plastic's fun. Oh, my goodness. Without plastic, what would have happened with Elvis? How would we all have all the music that we love? And I love live music, I, and, and we wouldn't have it without that vinyl record there, polyvinyl chloride. Uh, vinyl records are things that they enjoy us, in, enable us to enjoy our life. And the lady there, okay, she's walking through a rubbish dump, and that's awful, but guess what she's got in her hand? She's got a surfboard made of polymers. She's wearing lycra made of polymers, and she's probably used hair products with polymers too. 
Now, for me, I have a bit of a, a, a feeling about things that we shouldn't be using. So straws, they're not necessary in all cases. I know we've just recently uh, got legislation to ban plastic straws. But actually, for me, it's ban the straw because it's the item that's not necessary, not necessarily the material that's made of. It's, it's not needed. And wipes, these are just a growing thing that we've all been using recently. They didn't exist when I was younger. Uh, it's laziness, it's convenience, and it's a massive use of plastic, both the packaging and the uh, polyester wipe that's inside there, albeit impregnated with cleaning products, is made of plastic. So I'm going to get a bit boring, maybe, for you guys, but it's really important. The government spent about £140 million pounds in the last three years on polymer research uh, and innovation, and these bar charts show you the kind of things that they've been looking at, so waste management and uh, catalysis of materials, plastic production, etc. But notice the smallest amount of funding has been spent on human behaviour and human effects. So I think going forward, what we need to do is think about how we live with plastics, how we use them, and that's design is part of that because that's how we interact with each product. So it's really important. If you're interested in seeing who's done polymer research in the UK, there's a document on our website which is free to download and you can have a look at all the universities and what they're doing. I know you're all from universities here but you might not have interacted with that department in your university but it'll be there. So what's been going on? So if, did anyone watch the marathon? No? Yes, a few nods. <laughs> um, Ohu is a company that makes a seaweed uh, sachet that contains water. So lots of the runners picked this up and ran with it. I think it's a fantastic design. No waste at all, an edible packaging. None of those bottles were thrown on the floor by using that. These are projects we've actually funded through uh, government programs. Dissolvable polymers, uh, re extra recycled content, compostable polymers. The bottom right picture is uh, pyrolysis. Early on in my career, when I was doing some research, I actually did a lot of polymer, uh, polymer degradation through thermal pyrolysis of polymers, and that's a growing uh, way that we can look at the end of life of materials, perhaps the dirty mixed materials, turn them back into monomers and make them into polymers again. I've picked this one uh, just to let you know some of the universities that are being funded. So if any of you from any of those universities catch up with those guys in your departments, eight universities, they've got a million pounds each. There's lots of researchers, about 20 or 30 on average from each of those institutions are looking at different ways of circularity of material, uh, whether it's single use or reuse, whether it's um, material that's got better properties because they're using graphene, etc. And here's some pictures that show some of the things that are happening with uh, new polymers and new materials. And for, as designers, you might be really interested in what you can use um, to, to have kind of polymeric properties. So they can come from a biological source. I'm not going to steal everybody's thunder, though. We're talking about these things as well. Uh, they might be from banana fibers or mushroom materials. So these are quite quirky and novel, but there's something to think about in terms of design, what materials you might use. And now onto some of the actual designs for reuse. I really like the bottom right-hand one. Uh, a lady called Anna Bullis, who I met about 12 years ago now, um, had the idea to collect gum that's dropped on the pavement. It costs the councils lots of money. Put it in a container that's on a, a lamppost. And actually, when these are collected, she takes them, recycles them, and that container itself is made from the gum that was dropped on the floor. And I really think that's a fantastic uh, example of design for reuse and circularity, and it also saves the council loads of money. Uh, Gommy Speaker, these guys are fantastic. They have an av There's four of them in the company. They're a startup. Their average age is 22, uh, and they are taking uh, plastic bags. They've got a very Heath Robinson um, uh, set up and they're melting them in conventional ovens and then they have a mold and they're making these beautiful speakers and they're selling them for a very very large amount of money so that's a really good way of using waste material in a design aspect and then design actually sort of impinges on behavior uh, this is a, an, a company in LA but they have concentrated uh, cosmetic products and household cleaning products and you can add the water to them at home now, this is really good because you're not paying for the water, you're not transporting the water, and you only have to buy this part of the pack again, and you clip it into the bottom of the container. So the amount of material that's used is much, much smaller, and that's obviously design. I think design does interact with behavior in a very major way. So Cup Club uh, is, is one of the ways in which you're working with um, lots of the large uh, coffee shops so that you don't have to have a, a single-use cup. You can reuse it again and again. 
Uh, one of my favourites here is Garcon Wines. They've won lots and lots of awards. Check them out. This is a flat wine bottle, which you can post through your letterbox. It's absolutely brilliant when my, I forgot my sister's birthday, so <laughs> she was quite happy to get a, a bottle of wine through the letterbox. But it's 87% lighter than the glass equivalent. It's 40% smaller. It's made from 100% recycled polymer, and it itself can be sent back and recycled. So... I think my time is going to be great. This is our website. Uh, membership's free. If they've handed out some cards. Just join. You guys are going to be the future of the design changes that are going to need to be made around products made of plastic and how we use them. And that's fast-moving consumer goods and other products as well. Um, we have newsletters. I let you know about funding straight away. I have a Twitter uh, feed. And if I hear anything interesting and juicy, I'll put it on there as quick as I can. If you want to join the LinkedIn group, you can post and tell people about what you're doing so they can respond. And you've come here because you're interested in, in reuse. We have an event uh, in conjunction with RAP on the 6th of November in Birmingham, which is all about reuse. I'd love to see you there. Thank you. Okay, um, apologies for uh, the poor speech. If you're struggling to hear me, just give a wave and I'll, I'll try and speak up a bit. Um, so this morning I'd like to talk to you about RAP and more specifically, the UK Plastics Pact. So as previously been mentioned, we, um, we don't like to see plastic demonized. We like to see plastic as a world where plastic is valued and it doesn't pollute the environment. If I can just give you 30 seconds of why I'm here today. Um, I've spent most of my working life in plastics processing. And about a year ago, an opportunity arose a wrap that I felt would enable me to give a little back to the industry because I'd been banging on for years that it's not plastics per se that's the problem. It's the way we specify them, use them, and more importantly, discard them. So within the UK Plastics Pact, we've got, I think it's 76 now, businesses across the UK who are members, and they account for 85% of plastics packaging placed on the UK market through supermarkets. So by engaging with these businesses and guiding them towards using the inverted commas right plastics, we feel we're going to have a big impact on the material that's out there. The targets that we've set the UK Plastics Pack members are fourfold. The first one is to yeah, eliminate unnecessary single-use packaging. As previously been mentioned, straws, plastic stirrers, the little plastic jiggers that you see in hotels for um, uh, milk and so forth. There are always alternatives to these things which in the main end up as litter. The second target is that by 2025, all of the plastics packaging that's placed on the UK market will be reusable, recyclable and potentially compostable. The third target is really for local authorities, and that's to ensure that they recycle 70%, at least 70% of plastics packaging that's um, sent, that is collected at curbside. And the final one, which we're working with the retailers and brands on, is to ensure that there's an average of 30% recycled content in plastics packaging that's placed on the market. So where are we seeing plastics packaging in the moment? You won't be surprised to know that plastic bottles are the most common by weight. Those are mainly PET for water bottles and HDPE for things like milk bottles. Plastic film comprises 26% of packaging by weight and then pots, tubs and trays a third and that's primarily PET or polypropylene. This one's polypropylene. So in 2017, 2.2 million tonnes of plastics packaging was placed on the UK market, of which 1 million tonnes was recycled, 46%. 59% of plastics bottles were recycled, 33% of pots, tubs and trays, but only 4% of film. So what are the challenges? Consumers are confused about what they can recycle. These numbers, one, one through seven, they don't actually mean they're recyclable. They just designate what material 
the packaging is made from. But consumers are confused by that. There's also a lot of confusion about biopolymers, biodegradable, oxo-degradable, compostable, industrial compostable, and so on. And if people are interested, I'll be around later if they have questions. There's also a lot of variation across local authorities. 99% of them are collect plastic bottles, but this only accounts for 59% of plastics bottles being collected. That's because a lot of the smaller drinks bottles are used on the go. We might go out at lunchtime and buy a 500ml bottle, which will be in a PET bottle, but in the town centre there's nowhere to recycle it. This obviously needs addressing. Also, of the 1 million tonnes that was recycled in 2017, 66% of that was exported. This is changing, particularly since China and some other countries have closed their doors to imports. And the, num the percentage being recycled in the UK is increasing. So just to reiterate, what we're, what we're proposing as part of the Plastics Pact is not plastics free, but to move into a circular economy. And that means using materials such as PET, which is readily recycled, HDPE, which is recycled. So if you're designing this for food use, clear or natural is good, because HDPE for household chemicals, we like to put in coloured HDPE. So when it's recycled, it's kept separate from food grade HDPE. And then for pots, tubs and trays, polypropylene such as this one, or PET. Thank you. Okay, so I'm Matt Davis from the British Plastics Federation. Just super quickly, we're the trade association for the plastics industry. So anyone that manufactures or moulds plastics, recycles plastics, provides equipment, it's the entire supply chain of the plastics industry. We represent them. Um, the two things I'm going to talk about is one of them, the first one is recyclability by design, and then also the PVC sector of the plastics industry recently ran a competition on reuse, not necessarily recycling, uh, the step before that, which I'll go into details because we ran that in conjunction with the Materials and Design Exchange. So the first thing I wanted to sort of highlight and promote is a booklet that we've just sort of released in conjunction with Recoup, uh, who did a lot of the work, so big thanks to them, and it's called Recyclability by Design. Obviously, Plastic waste is a big issue at the moment, and the main focus pretty much is on packaging. Uh, you know, you don't really see construction materials floating around in the ocean. You don't see double glazed windows being littered. So the main thing is packaging. And this guide is just to help make sure that people are considering, you know, packaging typically it needs to obviously look good. It needs to be cost effective. But we also want to make sure that third tenant uh, sustainability is considered when designing a product, w w whether it be packaging or something else. So. There's detailed tips in this guide. I'm just going to give you the surface level stuff quickly. Just tips such as using the same material. For example, if you've got some paper packaging with a plastic window, that's multi-material, means it's probably not recyclable, and that's not useful. There's a, innovation is key to making plastics and the plastics industry more sustainable, but there's already simple design things we can do now to make current packaging more recyclable. Uh, the other one there, minimizing color. I know Rory touched on the, the milk bottles there. So, for example, the lids that you'll find on milk bottles, they were, I can't remember when it was, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, they, they got together and changed the pigment that was going into those milk top bottles so that when they were recycled, the material could be recovered and go back into to food contact. Easy separable closures. Again, that just means that the different materials that might be used, if it is more than one, can easily be separated. Um, avoiding full sleeves, again, that just ensures that there's, the materials are easily separated. It's good for the recycler. It means that that material can be recycled. Um, and small, easily removable labels, again, it just aids the process. It makes it easier for the consumer, which ultimately means that that uh, piece of packaging or product can be recycled. Because that's the other thing. When, you, when people talk about recycling rates in the UK, there is a certain amount of household recycler that is contaminated and therefore has to go to landfill. So it's, can we make it easier for the consumer so they can separate their waste properly? Uh, and just the last point um, on this guide is that within it, you'll find material-specific guidelines per the materials that some of my colleagues spoke about earlier as well. So things like PET bottles, which is the, the main 
liquid bottle that you'll, you'll find around, things like Coke bottles and water, you typically use PET, um, HDPE, polypropylene, polystyrene as well. So that brings me on to the competition that we recently ran that I wanted to talk about. So the PVC industry is a particular sector of the plastics industry, um, and PVC is predominantly used in construction. Um, it's made a lot of leaps and bounds over the, the last few decades because back in the 80s and 90s was not the most sustainable industry. Um, there wasn't really any recycling. It was sent to incineration, which would release dioxins. There was a lot of concerns about some of the additives that went into PVC. And it pretty much, that's why it, it's, you don't really find it nowadays in consumer products apart from fashion, you know, things like PVC skirts, MAC raincoats, and those kind of things. So the industry, um, about 20 years ago, had set up some voluntary initiatives to start becoming more sustainable. And the first one was Vinyl 2010. And the idea of that was to establish recycling targets for PVC, which they've now done, um, remove some of the, the more questionable additives that are in there. So there's no... Within the EU, there's no lead stabilizers used within PVC production. There is no um, cadmium additives used within the, uh, within the PVC sector. And um, they've also um, set up recycling targets. So last year, there was over 640,000 tons of PVC recycled across Europe. So recycling is pretty well established. It's typically construction products. Like I said, double glazed windows, flooring, roofing, those kind of things. So the industry thought, OK, can we look at reuse? Because recycling is a mechanical process. Can someone innovate a new product that takes these materials and puts them in a new format and reuses them without the recycling process? So that's where this PVC redesigned competition came about. It was done in conjunction with IOM3 and also the Materials and Design Exchange. Uh, Bernie Rickinson, who's in the audience, was a massive help in setting up this competition and getting it going. Um, and essentially, we opened it up to six design universities within the UK. Um, and the idea was, as it says there, look at designing using certain PVC items, an innovative reuse um, item. Obviously, us in the industry, we're, we're a bit technical and a bit boring. We're not the best at design. So I thought we'd open it up to design universities. And as a result, we got our three finalists who I just wanted to highlight. So the winning design was Karen Silver from um, London South Bank University. So I've got a typo in the top right there. Um, and her winning design was called Una, and it was for a portable water filtration device for use in developing nations. Um, the idea behind it was to take some PVC guttering, a PVC valve as well, add a water filtration system inside it, and you could, with the help of charities, donate this to developing nations so they could collect uh, water, sanitize it, and use it, obviously, for drinking. So it's tackling a, a, a real, really important sustainable development goal Within the, within the United Nations, um, and also reusing these PVC products. Um, there's a bit more detail there, so I appreciate you probably can't see the writing that well. Um, but it's just to show you there's some information there about the design and how it used the valve and the PVC pipes. Um, and again, a lot, there's, the winning designs, the students really went into detail about how to, how to make their products and also the actual economy of, of how that product would then be collected as well. Second place uh, was Kristen Tapping, again from London South Bank University. Um, and she had put together a PVC roofing system that also collected rainwater. Now, it might seem like a, a relatively simple idea. I mean, PVC is already used for roofing and guttering. But um, the, the realistic nature of this design is something that really impressed the judges. Um, again, like I said, high level of detail in terms of what they would use, PVC guttering, PVC pipes, uh, and other PVC materials to create a water buck system to also collect rainwater. Um, it's something that would be relatively cost effective to put together as well, um, and the route to market was seen as quite quick. So again, hence the reason it scored highly. Um, and just a few more details there, again, about the specific materials, the dimensions, and also the economy of how they would manufacture it, stick it all together, how they would then collect it, and complete the circular economy. And the third place uh, was from the Royal Col of College of Arts, and that was a lady called Helen Benz. So we had three female winners, which was great. And this was looking at, I don't know if any of you have heard of the Nari menstrual cups. They're reusable menstrual cups. Um, and she was focusing on the lack of sanitation within rural India um, and wanted to create a sanitation device for these menstrual cups. So she came up with this design. Um, and essentially, 
using some uh, reusing PVC items, including guttering and things, again, adding a water filtration system, you'll be able to collect water that might not be the cleanest. It would filter through. You could shake it around, use that to clean the menstrual device, and it would be targeted again at uh, women within places like rural India that might not have access to some of these items. And that's it. That was our redesign competition. And that's my size done. Just in time. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Marie. I'm a color material designer. And I'm originally from Denmark. And I used to study textiles in Copenhagen. And last year, I graduated from the Royal College of Arts. And um, I'm going to talk about my project I did there for my final project called Personal Plastic. Um, Studying textiles for me is really studying materials. So for my final year, I really wanted to discover a new material and go beyond traditional textiles. So I was looking for a challenge and decided to look at recycled plastic, um, how to make something we consider waste beautiful. So I went around to local coffee shops and begged for their recycling. I had a lot of um, uh, milk bottles. Uh, and discover what the great possibilities and the many um, avenues of recycling you could, you could explore. Um, but for the final project, I really didn't want to take um, plastic that was already in the recycling loop, out of that loop. So I was really looking for something um, to add and, and find a problematic uh, material. So I went for a walk, walk where I lived in London and found it really easy to find free materials. So I went to the Thames and there was a spot where it all washed up. And so my ambition really was to take all of this um, pollution, unwanted material that was just there, and make it into a 3D printable material. So I was a little naive. I thought you can just take all of this, put it into an extruder, and then you'll have 3D printed material. It'll be fun. But um, as I found out, it's not that easy. So um, when, when you want to recycle plastic, there are a lot of rules. Like you can't mix the different types. And of course, when you pick it up from the Thames, you don't know what it is and what it's made out of. Um, but that didn't really stop me, because I wanted to see what happens when you try to break the rules. Um, and I had a lot of help from different companies really interested in, in investing in this area. So I got a lot of free machinery and just started making and seeing what would happen, really. Um, so I'm not a material scientist. So I knew from the beginning I was never going to make the new um, revolutionary plastic material that would change everything. But I wanted to take all the knowledge that I have as a textile designer and apply it onto recycled plastic and explore um, how you could fuse those two things and create a new aesthetic for recycling. So I used, uh, I looked at all the processes I knew, like printmaking um, and spinning yarns, treating plastic like yarn, um, and dyeing it um, myself, uh, and how to really apply those techniques to plastic and adapt them. Um, so that. Um, so I made a lot of tests, and the first one here, the top right, is um, HDPE and PET, so milk bottle plastic and uh, water bottle plastic mixed together, um, and that creates a really fragile um, textured plastic. And then next to it is um, HDPE plastic that um, so that has a lot of dirt in it because when you pick things up from the Thames, of course, it's really it's really dirty, you have to clean, that's a long process, not always successful. The bottom right is when my um, thermometer broke and all the plastic just melted to the highest temperature. It made it kind of like a soap-like texture. And then next to that is when you mix the different plastics and you don't know what it is, it creates a really weird type of material, which I thought was really interesting. Um, even though it's not practical, I really want to explore plastic that is not convenient, plastic that is maybe more fragile and more precious than that. Um, so what I created was really a, a huge library, a cat catalog of recycled material using all the different processes I could get, get hold of, trying to spin my own plastic yarn and dyeing in different way, creating blocks, turning it on a lathe, and really just exploring recycled plastic. 
Um, and I even got to do some 3D printing in the end as well, working with a company. Um, uh, and just, um, yeah, discovering what plastic recycling could be from my perspective. And beyond the library as well, so I created this whole catalog of that was on display at the RCA so people could see what could become of all this plastic. But I also took these pictures to show what plastic could uh, speculate, what plastic could be in the future if it wasn't a convenient material, but something precious and rare. So kind of calling it this fragile plastic that is almost like um, sculptural. And so the far right picture that is an image to communicate how much you can get from one material. It's all made from PET, so plastic bottle, um, water bottle plastic. Uh, and so it's 3D print, PET that melted at a high temperature, um, extruded PET and PET that spun as, as a yarn. So that picture shows one material, but how much you can gain from just that if you recycle it. Um, yeah, and exploring 3D print that's imperfect and just extruding different textures of mixed material. Um, so that was, that, was, um, that was kind of the end to that project. And then afterwards, I got a job as a color material designer for a automotive company. So quite a different area and very much focusing on practicality and the in, in the industry. Um, it's been a new way of learning about how to try and, and implement some sustainability and think about recyclability in that industry. And we have a lot of clients who are really interested in sustainable uh, materials, but that is such a big word, what is sustainability? So we try to engage them, for instance, with plastic. It might, it's a really great lightweight material for a car. Um, and it's not necessarily that a uh, plastic alternative is the right way, so we try to engage in talks about maybe it's thinking about what happens to the car afterwards. And so we, that's really great discussions with our clients, so I'm learning a lot from that, um, trying to combine the artistic view and the, and the industry. Um, yeah, that's kind of it. And so if you want to know more, feel free to contact me, and I have an exhibition on in a couple of weeks in Common Garden. So at the RM Gallery. Yeah, that's it. Um, so uh, we've got about 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, some of you who've, re well, all of you who've registered did um, give us some questions in advance. Uh, so I shall throw those to the panel, but I'd just like to open it to the floor first. And we've got a raving mic. Has anybody got any questions first off? There's a question as far away from the mic as possible, right over the other end of the room, please. Chap in check shirt. Huh? Oh, I'm Brendan, Cav uh, Brendan from Plymouth University. Um, and one of the biggest uh, plastic pollutions you find on beaches is, uh, is pre-production pellets. I was wondering how the plastic industry is working to uh, avoid this getting into the ocean. So yeah, um, obviously, one of the things you do find in some locations is pre-production plastic pellets. Um, unfortunately, it's difficult to stop the pellets that might not be coming from the UK, um, obviously, typically when there's all tank spills. But one of the initiatives we have uh, that the BPF has set up is Operation Clean Sweep. And that's something we've been getting our members to sign up to, which is a voluntary commitment and initiative to stop uh, virgin pellets, so the, the nurdles that the gentleman was talking about, escaping from their plants and ending up in the environment. Uh, typically things like when the trucks come to deliver the pellets, if there's any spillages, how do they minimize that? Things like um, making sure there's covers on the drains. Um, and it's an initiative that I think we've got over 130 sites signed up now. TD Ports, which I can't remember where that is in the country, but they're the first port that signed up to that initiative. And again, it's really important because that ship transport is another key area or a key risk area where pellets can escape. So the idea is to keep promoting Operation Clean Sweep and keep getting more and more ports and companies signed up to it. So, quick question. About, uh, we see a lot of innovation, a lot of really good ideas, uh, but um, there seems to be a barrier between some of these ideas being commercialized uh, and exploited. So they're taken you know, up by the big companies, they're uh, uh, being used uh, more, uh, more frequently, and I think there might be a, a barrier there in, with regard to commercialization. 
barriers to commercialisation? I suppose this, I suppose this one's mine. <laughs> um, Innovate UK, which is our funder for the Knowledge Transfer Network and also the funder for the Plastic Circular, Circular Plastics Network, which I'm running, actually funds companies in that TRL level that you're talking about. So they won't do the early stage academic research but they will fund projects to pilot scale. They won't take them to the final point uh, with, in terms of maybe um, investors or venture capitalists, but the KTN does have access to those people. So if you've got any specific companies, a bit of feedback, um, we can help you with that. It's one of the roles of the KTN to help companies commercialize. Any other thoughts from the panel? Okay, are there other questions from the floor? Thank you. Um, hi, uh, I'm Matt from Falmouth, and I was wondering, um, basically, you were saying that obviously local councils kind of struggle to, you know, effectively recycle everything that they get, uh, and I wondered what, like, opportunities you thought there might be for kind of private companies to start up as, you know, kind of take over the recycling game and kind of turn it into a kind of privatized industry almost? Do you reckon there's any kind of room in the UK for such a company to exist? I think there probably is room for that to exist. It just needs a, a bit of a kick start. Um, the value of recycled high density polythene, for example, um, is, is very high at the moment. It's so high that the milk manufacturers can't afford to buy it because their margins are so small. And it's being taken by some of the other larger businesses who are using it in products such as this. So yes, I'm sure there is. And I'll, I'll definitely second that. There are quite a few companies I'm aware of that are collecting materials such as fishy filaments there in Cornwall. So they're taking fishing nets. They are 3D printing that material into the, the, the fins on surfboards. And there is a lot more activity. I think people can see the volumes of material and they're thinking, what can we do with it? So, yeah. And just a final one to... Just finally as well on that is that making it easier for the consumer will improve the quality of the recycler as well. So typically, obviously, local authorities have their contractors who collect the waste. Um, there was a recent consultation for the government on consistent collections, because I think for household waste, there's over 300 different collection systems in the UK. You know, So if you're in London, you might not have a separate food waste bin, other places you do. So making that more simple for consumers means they know what they're doing, and ultimately, you can improve the recycling rates. Okay, fantastic. Um, question at the back next to the speaker. Hi, my name is Hannah Robinson. I'm from the architecture, design and fashion team at the British Council. Um, I would really love to know your opinion on how we can get more emerging groups of designers to work together more internationally. So how could we get groups of designers in the UK to collaborate with international emerging designers around this topic? I think there's someone in the audience that would like to answer this one. <laughs> Is that a fair, Bernie or John? Yeah, <laughs> I put you on the spot, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I think it's an excellent point and more, more of that global linkage is required. Um, I go back perhaps um, to a period, what was it, I don't know if Robert is here, but maybe around about five or six years ago, um, where we collected a group of stories associated with reuse, particularly reuse, where it uh, overlapped with polymers, it overlapped with textiles, it overlapped with pretty well all materials, and we took that as a composite catalogue of UK experience into Holland to share it. Um, that led, in actual fact, to an equivalent showcase, a joint showcase with Holland. Um, sadly, as with all networks, you have to keep fueling them to keep them alive. But I think without doubt, these sorts of issues associated with material use and reuse are a global requirement, not an individual country requirement. And it's this composite between design and materials, hence the shirt, that actually makes the difference. So if we could create a network of networks globally where materials and design ex exchange 
could be something of a norm, I'm sure we'd achieve great strides. Okay, I'm going to throw in a couple of questions that we received in advance. Um, so one interesting one that's touched on many of your presentations, how can sustainable materials actually be made more desirable, particularly in mainstream fashion and automotive sectors? So Mary, perhaps you've illustrated some of that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I just think it's, it's also about getting to the consumer that it is, is a, maybe a more valuable material than the virgin plastic, for instance. Um, because it has to go through such a lot process, so maybe it's about describing what it takes to recycle and why it's important, and think about not only doing what we usually do with recycling and the look that it usually has, go beyond that and think about aesthetics as well. And another one, um, given that you're a, an audience mainly of, of graduates who are showcasing here, um, so what are, what are the sort of one question has been, what's the best way to get into the sustainability and materials industry? <laughs> uh, well, I guess, I mean, all I can really say on that front is that I think all industries are focused on it a lot more. There's a lot more, wh whether it's companies that aren't in design and they just have their, their, social, their corporate social responsibility is a lot more focused on uh, the materials they're using just in the office. Um, I think the design companies as well and even retailers and manufacturers and brands are more focused on it. Typically one of the barriers, you know, people talked about uh, recyclable materials or sustainable materials, they might cost more, how do you make them more desirable? Everyone's hands have always been tied by their customer, you know, so the person producing the packaging would say, well, the, the brand needs it to look a certain way and, and perform a certain function, so I have to make it like that. The brands would say, well, the, the consumer, you know, the public, then they buy this product that looks better more. But I think now there's been sort of a, more of an awakening from the consumers and from the public. I think that's a positive thing which will trickle up the chain. So I think even if you find yourself in these traditional sort of uh, design roles, there's a much bigger focus now on sustainability. It's one of the key aspects of designing a product now is what's going to happen to it at its end of life. Thank you. Um, and I've got one last question, if there are any others from the floor. Lady towards the, the back. Uh, hello, my name is Claire Potter. I'm a um, circular economy designer and also a lecturer at the University of Sussex. Um, I think it's brilliant to see so many projects throughout the whole of New Designers that are actually using reusable plastics, recycled plastics in lots of different ways. But we know that there's a huge amount of ingredients and additives that go into plastics by manufacturers that aren't identifiable. So we know the plastic itself, but we don't know exactly what's going into it. And I do have a worry that with all the reuse of plastic recycling that we might be causing potential health issues further down the line because we don't know what's actually in the plastics. So, is there any drive from industry to actually allow manufacturers and push manufacturers to be more transparent about what is going in their, their materials from the start point, so then as designers we can best reutilize them at the second life, third life, fourth life? Yes, um, within the uh, UK Plastics Pact, we are just releasing on the 16th of July a polymer guidance uh, doc uh, document to enable retailers, Tesco, Sainsbury, etc., and brands, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, and so forth. We've given them guidelines as to which materials to use. And the, the hierarchy is always to go for clear or natural first, because it has a much higher value and it has much more outlets for recyclability. The only exception is keeping household chemicals out of the food contact chain. But that'll be on our website from the 16th of July. I only want to answer this one because one of the roles I had in the medical industry was making pharmaceutically clean polymers. So if you're going to inhale a drug and it's been in contact with a polymer, you don't want to get anything in there that's bad for you at all. So it's quite possible to formulate these materials with less, materi with less additives, but you do need some for processing. I can tell you that if you clean this up and recycle it, it actually has less additives and process aids in it after it's been cleaned up. 
than than it had in the first place. So it's quite possible to do it. And I think where they can, they will be working, you know, towards, you know, to do that. And of course, that's going to be quite important going forwards with respect to recycled content, the 30% recycled content in packaging. If that's coming from a source that isn't, it, it will have to be clean. And it'll have to be uh, enable it to be in, in food contact. So that kind of level of additive manufacture and, and use is, it's possible. It's possible to reduce it. So that's, you know, a good thing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I just wanted to build on Sally's point just to kind of reassure people as well is that within the EU and the UK, we have pretty stringent uh, rules and regulations around particularly food contact materials, uh, the toy safety directive, things like that. So for people putting recycled content back into potentially food contact applications, medical applications, there's pretty stringent rules around there to ensure safety, to make sure these chemicals, other chemicals aren't potentially leaching in there. The other thing as well is a lot of plastics manufactured the additives, again, under certain EU regulations, um, they're limited to what they can put in, and it's all about hazard versus risk. Um, a good example of that is petrol. You know, petrol is a hazardous toxic chemical, but you use it every day to fill up cars because the risk is mitigated. So if those additives might be in a particular product, the idea is that they, they will migrate at such a low level that there's no danger posed to the consumer. But obviously, like you said, those materials then being recycled, for them to meet the requirements to go back into a food safety application, that additive would have to be removed or it would be another polymer that's used. Okay, thank you. That was a great question to end with, actually. Um, we, I'm not going to keep you from going and grabbing some lunch now, and there's going to be another talk here at 1 o'clock. Um, I've got two things. First of all, could you thank our panel for contributing such excellent talks today? And I'm, I'm sure they'll be around for five minutes or so if you want to grab them individually afterwards. Um, I just want to also want to say thank you to my colleague John Bound, who's actually organised the, the session today. So thank you, John. Um, and John, you've put, I've... <laughs> you wanted to give us some details on the... Could you put your hand up? Okay. So um, the, some of you may have already had these cards, which are headed up, Requests for Materials and Design Clinic. Uh, if you have, you can ignore the card. If you haven't, uh, and you, we've got a team of about half a dozen or so material science experts, um, Sally, Bernie at the back there, and several others covering the whole range from plastics to sustainable materials to metals, composites, nanotechnology. If you would like a visit to your stand by Sally or one of the, her colleagues uh, this afternoon, please complete the card and uh, either leave it on the table here now or bring it along to office number 218, which is in the main hall. It's under the big clock. There's a kind of mezzanine. And look for office number 218, which is the Knowledge Transfer Network, KTN. Um, there's a box outside where you can drop your uh, card in. If, but please do that by 2 o'clock at the latest, uh, because then we'll be sharing the cards out. So either fill it in right now and leave it at the front or office number 218 on the mezzanine floor in the main hall under the big clock. Uh, thank you very much, Ed, for chairing this uh, excellent session.